dedicated to the strength of the nation. Proudly, we hail. Yes, proudly we hail, starring Gloria D. Haven in Perilous Journey, United States Army and United States Air Force presentation. Now here is our producer, the well-known Hollywood showman, C.P. McGregor. Thank you, thank you, and greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Theater of Stars, where each week your motion picture favorites appear in plays we know you'll enjoy. Today our star is Gloria De Haven, and the title of our story, Perilous Journey. We'll have the curtain for Act One right after this important message from Wendell Niles. When a man wears the uniform of the United States Army or the United States Air Force, he puts on pride with his clothing, pride in his job, in the service of which he is a part, in himself and in his country. Whenever the uniform appears, honor goes with it, and the understanding that the uniform of a soldier or airman of the United States is a symbol of freedom and democracy. These are facts to be remembered by all of us. The uniform of the United States is proud and honorable wherever it is worn. Now, once again, our producer. The curtain rises on Act One of Perilous Journey, starring Gloria De Haven as Judith Kent. <laughs> It is midnight in Cape Town, South Africa. At its docks lies the ocean liner Star of the South, about to get underway for New York via Dakar. Now a taxi cab rounds the corner and pulls to a stop on the pier. Judith Kent gets out, pays the driver, and stands staring at the cab as it pulls away. I stood there on the pier a moment, waiting. But waiting for what? I didn't know. I was almost positive I'd been followed to the dock. But by whom and why? Why all the other strange things that had happened to me in the last 24 hours? The attempt by someone to break into my apartment last night. The feeling of being watched all day and now, now of being followed here to the waterfront. None of it made sense. And as I went aboard, I hoped that whatever this thing was, I'd left it behind me in Cape Town. Good evening, miss. Oh. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to startle you. I'm the purser. Oh, yes. Welcome aboard, miss. Kent. Judith Kent. Oh, yes, Miss Kent. State from 223. Yours was a last-minute reservation, wasn't it? Yes, I, I've been visiting in Cape Town and decided to leave sooner than I'd planned. Cape Town must have become very unpopular suddenly. We've had several last-minute reservations. Steward, Steward. Oh, yes, sir. The steward here will show you to your cabin. Stateroom 223. If you'll follow me. Thank you. I followed the steward down the deck a ways then stopped and looked at the dock, which was sliding slowly away from us now. When I looked up, the steward was out of sight around the corner. I started after him, turned the corner, and... Oh! Sorry. I wasn't looking where I was going. Did I hurt you? No, no, not at all. I'm all right. Sure? You look so startled. Oh, I, I guess I'm just a little nervous. Oh. Uh, my name is Greg Mitchell. I'm Judith Kent. Judith. You know, they, they talk about bumping into people. This is the first time I've ever done it, literally. <laughs> I guess it's the first time for me, too. Much better this way. I uh, might have had to wait days for an introduction. Well, if you'll excuse me. Oh, of course, but, uh, well, I hope I'll be seeing you around. I, I suppose so, Mr. Mitchell. Good night. I went to my stateroom, unpacked, and went to bed. By morning, the sea had become choppy, and I, I didn't feel much like breakfast, so I went to my deck chair. On one side of me sat a man about 40, almost too well-groomed. On the other side, an elderly woman. Finally, the woman spoke. I beg your pardon. I'm Mrs. Mays. Good morning. You don't look very well, my dear. Is there anything I can do? Oh, oh thanks. I'll be all right as soon as I get my sea legs. <laughs> of course. I've been on a world cruise, so I have permanent sea legs, I guess. I, I hope it's been a good cruise for you. No and... cruise is a good cruise, my dear. Hmm? They're all completely boring. Although your presence may yet uh, 
save this cruise for me. Well, I... We haven't met, of course. No, we haven't. It's a silly custom, the exchange of names. Everyone feels to be necessary before conversation is in order, but uh, I'll indulge it. I'm Christopher Jeffrey. You're Judith Kent. Why, yes. How did you know? No. My dear, I always select my deck chair with great care. This will be a fortunate arrangement. You will keep me entertained with your beauty, and I'll keep you amused with my wit. <laughs> well, that sounds fair enough, Mr. Jeffrey. Hello there. Oh, good morning, Mr. Mitchell. Good morning. Oh, look, we've known each other for 12 hours now. Couldn't you make it Greg? I suppose so. Mrs. Mays, Mr. Jeffrey, Greg Mitchell. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, here's a copy of the ship's newspaper, Judith. No, I'm afraid I don't feel much like reading it right now. Thanks. Well, not much news anyway. Except for a little excitement in Cape Town. Oh? Yeah. A guy was murdered there the night before last. Sort of a playboy type, I guess. Name was Henry Stocker. Henry Stocker? Did you know him? Yes. Yes, I did. Henry Stocker murdered. I couldn't believe it. Why, I'd had dinner with Henry in Cape Town the night before last. The very night he'd been murdered. He told me he was also going to New York soon. He suggested we have a date when he got there and even gave me some trinkets, as he called them, so I wouldn't forget him or the date. Two rhinestone clips. Why, yes, I was even wearing one of them right now on my jacket. The other was on my coat in the closet. Now Henry was dead. Murdered. I'm sorry if I upset you. I didn't realize. What? Oh. Oh, it was just rather a shock. Did you know him very well? Not really. Oh, he took me out several times. Uh, my I... dear, must you keep toying with that trinket you're wearing? It makes me nervous. Oh? I didn't even realize I was. That's a very good-looking clip, Judith. Interesting design. I will never comprehend why women feel it necessary to adorn themselves with uh, cheap costume jewelry. It's possibly some sort of throwback to the primitive. If you'll excuse me, I... I think I'll walk around a bit. I'll see you all later. As I walked, a sudden thought popped into my head. The strange things which had happened to me just before I sailed. Could they be connected in some way with Henry Stocker's murder? Oh, no, but the idea was fantastic. I went to my stateroom, opened my door, and then I stopped. My closet door was open, swinging back and forth with the motion of the ship. And yet I distinctly remembered closing that door before I'd left my stateroom. The next day or two, I didn't have much time to think about it. Maybe that was because I was thinking about Greg Mitchell. We were strongly attracted to one another, and yet there was always something standing between us. It all came to a head the night before we arrived in Dakar. Something's bothering you, Greg. What is it? Oh, it's nothing, Judith. But, Greg... I said it's nothing. Sorry. It, it's all right. Did you see the ship's paper this morning? No. Why? Seems the police think that Cape Town friend of yours, Henry Stocker, was involved in some kind of shady activity before he was murdered. Shady activity? What do you mean? They don't know. It's hard to believe. I didn't know Henry very well, but he was always nice to me. And sure, I guess women are all alike. Give him a rhinestone clip and I think you're a fine guy. Why, Greg, I... That sounds like jealousy. Yeah, I guess it is. I... Greg, Greg, what is it? If it's this clip, if it bothers you that much, I won't wear it anymore. No, no, wear it by all means. This design is interesting, too. Greg, what are you talking about? Skip it. I, I just wish you'd tell me what's the matter. I don't like to see you like this. Judith, what are your plans after this cruise? I, I don't know. Why? I'd, I'd like to be part of those plans, Judith. I'd like you to be, Greg. I like you very much. Perhaps too much. Because we haven't known each other very long. Long enough for me to... Fall in love with you. Oh, Greg. Judith, I... I... I'll see you later. Greg! Greg! A oh. very uh, tender scene, my dear. What? Oh, Christopher, I... I didn't see you. Our young hero starts to kiss the fair damsel, then flees in confusion. You've been... been watching. Of course. 
very noble of you. <laughs> My dear, I think you're wasting your time with that young lout. Please allow me to determine that, Christopher. And incidentally, I wish you wouldn't stare at me constantly as you've done these past two days. My dear, I both admire and pursue beauty in whatever form I find it. And I shall continue to do so. Good night. <laughs> I went to my stateroom, opened the door, and turned on the light. I, I couldn't believe it, but there it was. My clothes strewn all over the room, drawers pulled open, even cushions ripped apart. My stateroom had been completely ransacked. I ran out into the hall. There was no one in sight. I found Mrs. Mays in her stateroom and poured out the whole story to her. My dear, I'm so glad you felt you could come to me. I, I just had to talk to someone, Mrs. Mays. It's all so confusing. If only I knew why. Why I was followed to the ship in Cape Town. Why my stateroom was ransacked just now. And, and why Greg is acting the way he does. Uh, this uh, Greg Mitchell. Mrs. Mays. Something I haven't told you yet. This evening, Greg referred to the fact that Henry Stalker had given me this rhinestone clip on my coat. Yes. I've never told Greg that Henry gave me the clip. You're sure of that? Yes. How does he know so much about me? And what does he want? He seems like such a nice young man. Yes, but what is he really? Oh, and there's one more thing, the worst of all. What is it? I... I think I'm in love with him. But I managed to quit thinking about my troubles the next day ashore in Dakar. Mrs. Mays and I both enjoyed ourselves. Along in the afternoon, she became tired, but I wanted to do some more shopping. So we arranged to meet at dark in the lounge of the hotel. I shopped the rest of the afternoon. Then at sunset, went to the hotel. But Mrs. Mays was nowhere in sight. Finally, I went up to one of the attendants. Uh, yes, miss? Oh, I was supposed to meet a Mrs. Mays here. Have you... Oh, uh, you're, you're Miss Kent. Why, yes. Yes, sir. Here's a note for you. Oh. I decided to take a walk in the gardens. Please meet me there, Mrs. Mays. Oh, thank you, Porter. I went out on the terrace and down into the garden. It was dark now, and I couldn't see Mrs. Mays anywhere. I started to go back, but suddenly a, a bush rustled behind me. I tried to turn around, but something dark and soft slid quickly over my head, like, like a blanket. I, I struggled. I was pressed tighter against my face. I, I couldn't even breathe. Everything started whirling, and my lungs felt as if they would burst. And then, and then everything went black. <laughs> Pause briefly from our story, Perilous Journey, starring Gloria de Haven, to bring you an important message from our government. The man in the front office is the man with a future. He's the pilot of a United States Air Force fighter, bomber, or transport. And it's possible you can be one of these young men with wings. You see, if you are between the ages of 20 and 26 and one half, with two years of college, or the ability to pass an equivalent examination and physically fit, you have the basic qualifications that may enable you to become an aviation cadet. If you qualify, you'll receive a full year's training, and then those pilot's wings and a commission in the Air Force Reserve as second lieutenant, plus orders to active duty at once, with beginning pay up to $336 per month. Outstanding graduates will receive regular commissions immediately in the Air Force. Also, pilots with commissions in the Air Force Reserve can qualify for regular commissions while they are on active duty. That's how you can become the front office man with a future. For full details, visit your nearest Air Force base or U.S. Army and U.S. Air Force recruiting station at once. Only the best can be aviation cadets. Curtain rises on Act Two of Perilous Journey, starring Gloria de Haven as Judith Kent. Judith lies unconscious in a hotel garden in Dakar, West Africa, victim of a mysterious attack which has climaxed a strange series of events beginning when she boarded a ship in Cape Town. After what seemed a long while, the blackness began to fade. It seemed to me I could hear someone calling my name. 
The voice grew louder and louder until I suddenly found myself lying there, still in the hotel garden. Julia! 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 Oh. Oh. What? Why, Mrs. Mays. Thank heavens. I, I was afraid. Oh, you're all right, child. I... I think so. Here, here, let me help you up. What in the world happened? I don't... I don't know. When I got to the hotel lounge, they... They handed me a note telling me to... To meet you here in the garden. What? Why? Why, I didn't write any note. You didn't? Well... Well, then who did? And why? Oh, but why all the other things? It's like being in a dark... I just can't stand it much longer. Oh, I there, just... there, child. I, I know. I know. I'm sorry. I'll be all right. I'm just tired. Of course. Here, pull your coat up around your shoulders, dear. It's chilly out here. Yes, I... Mrs. Mays. What is it? The clip. The what? The rhinestone clip Henry Stocker gave me. The one I've been wearing on this coat. It's... it's gone. Are you sure you were wearing it today? Oh, yes, yes. Mrs. Mays, you don't think... You don't think that's why I was choked? Because of the clip? Now, wait. Greg was interested in the clip. Judith. Oh, Judith, oh, Judith look. There's Greg Mitchell uh, coming toward us. Come on. You don't want to talk to him? No, no, I just want to get back to the ship. Please, let's hurry. <laughs> sat in the lounge alone while the ship got underway. Greg was nowhere in sight. Good evening, my dear. Oh, Christopher. Did you have a uh, pleasant day ashore? Not particularly. Personally, uh, I don't like these tropical ports. They're not safe. The natives are such thieves. Only very briefly. Would you care for a cocktail, my dear? No, thank you. Good night. I went to my room and locked my door. I was almost certain it was Greg who was responsible for everything. But how to find out for sure? And what if I did find out? Could that change the fact that, that I did love him? Then I thought of the question that I might ask the purser in the morning. Greg had told me he'd made his reservation on the boat a long time ago. The purser could quickly tell me whether that was true or not. I was just going to bed when I glanced at my door. Then my eyes riveted on the doorknob. It was turning slowly. And it turned back again. And that was all. But it meant someone had tried the door to find out whether it was locked. And if it hadn't been locked, I just sat there without sleeping the rest of the night. As soon as morning came, I hurried to the purser's office. Good morning, Miss Kent. I was just leaving. Boat drills in the minute, you know. Was there something you wanted? Oh, yes. When did Greg Mitchell make his reservation on the boat? Mr. Mitchell, let me see. Oh, this was another last-minute reservation. Matter of fact, he made his reservation after you made yours. You're... You're very sure about that? Why, well, certainly. Thank you, Percy. So now I knew. It was simple as that. Greg had lied to me. The purser handed me a copy of the ship's paper and left. I started back to my stateroom, just as the signal for boat drill sounded. I knew every passenger was supposed to report to his lifeboat, but, but I just wanted to be alone. Hello, Judith. Greg. Let's talk. Please leave me alone. Judith. Get out of my way. I want to know what's the matter. Oh, nothing's the matter, Greg. I just made a mistake, that's all. Mistake? Yes. I was foolish enough to think it was I you were interested in, instead of a... a... Of what? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Look, Judith. A job's a job. I... Let go of me. Judith! Come back here, Judith! I ran to my room and locked the door. I guess I sat there staring dully at the wall for five minutes before I realized I was still holding in my hand the ship's paper the purser had given me. I opened it up, but the print swam before my eyes. I dimly made out the name Henry Stocker something about the Nobel Diamond. Whatever that was. But I couldn't go on reading. And then... Oh! Who is it? It's Mrs. Mays, dear. Oh, just a minute. 
Oh, I'm, I'm so glad it's you, Mrs. Mays. I thought... Why, Judith, what's the matter? I just found out, Mrs. Mays. It's Greg, all right. It's been Greg all along. But I still don't know why. The story is right in your hand, Judith. Ship's paper. What? Yes, the Cape Town police discovered that Henry Stalker had stolen a large diamond a week before he was murdered. A diamond? But what has that to do with... Those rhinestone clips? Yes, Judith. Stalker put the diamond in one of those clips he gave you. Then he intended to get it back in New York. Exactly. But Stalker's killer realized you must have the clip. Then... Then it was Greg who killed Henry Stalker and took the clip from me. But Mrs. Mays, he, he tried once more, after I went back to the ship last night. After he took one of the clips. That means... That means he took the wrong clip, Judith. Then... Then I still have the diamond. In this clip. Quite right, my dear. And now, please give it to me. What? I said, give me the clip. Oh, but I don't understand. I... Come, come, my dear. Must I use this? A gun? Yes. And it'll do you no good to scream. All the passengers are at boat trip. Mrs. Mays, I... I can't believe it. You're wasting time. Give me that clip at once. You mean... You're the one who killed Henry? Who ransacked my room? Who arranged the trap into car? I got the wrong clip then. I didn't realize there were two of them. Now give me the other one. You can't get away with this, Mrs. Mays. You're being very naive, my dear. Officially, I'm not feeling well. When the steward brought my tea ten minutes ago, I was in bed. So you see, Judith, when he comes for the tray, I will still be there, and you'll be dead. No one would believe a nice old lady like me would kill anyone. Oh, no. All right, Mrs. Mays. What? Why, Greg. Drop that gun. Drop it. Oh, Greg, I... Are you okay, Judith? Yes, yes, I, I just don't understand. I thought you were after the diamond. I am, but legitimately. Insurance companies don't like to have valuable jewels stolen. They even go so far as to hire detectives to find them. Oh, Greg, I've been so wrong. I'm afraid it's mutual, Judith. But maybe after I turn Mrs. Mays over to the captain, we can make up for it, huh? So that's what I meant when I said the suspicions were mutual. Oh, I see. You thought I was in the diamond robbery with Henry Stalker. Well, you did look like a choice suspect. <sighs> yes, I, I guess I did. But then I began to notice that both Jeffrey and Mrs. Mays were very interested in you. I investigated Jeffrey and found out he was harmless. But I discovered Mrs. Mays was lying about being on a world cruise. I figured she might be lying about a few other things, too. But how did she know I was in my room during boat drill? I told her. You did? I had to find out if she was the one. When she started for your room, I knew she was. I followed her. Oh, oh it's just like, like waking up from a nightmare, Greg. I'll bet. Thinking I was after you, and... <laughs> of course, I uh, have been after you, but not exactly that way. <laughs> Judith. Uh-huh? Maybe... Maybe when we get to New York. Not maybe, Greg. Oh, yes. Darling. Look, uh, just one thing. Mm -hmm. Do me a favor. Of course. What is it? The next time anybody gives you a rhinestone clip, kindly throw it in the nearest ocean. Oh, I will, darling. I promise you. Curtain Falls in the final act of Perilous Journey. Our star, Gloria DeHaven, will return for a curtain call after this timely message from Wendell Niles. How about it, men? Are you interested in a secure future with regular pay, promotions, and the chance to build the kind of career you've always wanted based on education and travel? Of course you are. And you'll find all these in the United States Army. The young man who enlists today has the chance to choose from more than 60 different technical courses and can increase his skill and ability to earn. While that young man is in the service, he will find many chances to compete for Officers Candidate School or appointment to West Point. 
And in addition, there is a chance to travel overseas with a 20% increase in pay. A young man who enlists for three years today in the U.S. Army can do so directly for service in Europe, or if he prefers, for service in Japan and the Far East. Learn the details at your nearest U.S. Army and U.S. Air Force recruiting station at once. Now, once again at the microphone, our star, Gloria DeHaven, and our producer. Gloria, we certainly welcome you back to Proudly We Hail. Thank you, C.P. Of course, everyone knows how beautiful you are, but you're devastating, more beautiful than ever. Oh, my goodness, all these compliments. Then my little vacation did some good after all. We missed you in pictures, but wait until the folks see you in your newest at MGM. Correction, C.P. I'm doing one at Universal now, alone out. But I hope they'll be as kind as you've been. Fact is, I wish folks could see you right now. Wonder if I could describe that very striking outfit you have on. I dare you to try. <laughs> First, well, I know you have a new short hairdo, beautiful blonde, soft curls, by the way. You're doing all right. Do you want to try for four dollars? Next, uh, a little white collar and cuffs, pilgrim style. PK. Now you have four dollars. Want to try for eight? A cameo brooch and a small blue and whiter, sort of a snowflake dotted dress. Yes. Now here's where you go back to eight dollars. Leg of mutton sleeves, and here's the part I like. A bright red knife-pleated apron. Why, you look like an old-fashioned print from a courier in Ives or Priscilla Mullins just off the Mayflower. Why, C.P., it's the very latest fashion. It's known as Ensemble Colonial Tablier. That's what I mean. An old-fashioned pilgrim outfit with an apron. I <laughs> wonder how Adrian would like my description. You hit the <laughs> jackpot, C.P., but you like it. Like it? You're a dead ringer for Priscilla. No wonder John Alden blew his top over her. Why, thank you, sir. And C.P., I've enjoyed every minute of my visit here with you. And I hope you'll ask me back again soon. Now, what have you in store for all of us next week? Next week, Gloria, and ladies and gentlemen, we present beautiful June Havoc and Two's a Crowd. It's a fast-moving comedy romance that you won't want to miss. I'll be listening. Goodbye, C.P. Goodbye, Gloria De Haven. Be sure to join us next week, ladies and gentlemen, when we bring you June Havoc and Two's a Crowd. Until then, this is C.P. McGregor saying thanks for listening, and cheerio from Hollywood. <laughs>